This is the Courier 13 podcast with Warner Andrews. My goal with this show is to present conversations among filmmakers that impart knowledge and inspiration to people who are currently making cinematic content, or for those who aspire to make movies and television but don't have the know-how yet to start, or for people who are just fascinated by the filmmaking process and the entertainment industry. My guest is screenwriter and DePaul faculty member, Scott Myers. Scott, how are you doing? How are you doing today? Well, uh, considering what we're one plus year into this whole Zoomageddon pandemic thing, I'm doing well. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's, yeah, I was actually just thinking about it today since, you know, it, it was really nice outside in, in springtime. Uh, it, you know, it's, if I wasn't still in film school, I, I don't think I would feel so much of the Zoom again, <laughs> if, that, if that makes sense. I feel just like, just because this is our, uh, our communication of choice now at DePaul, I feel, I just, every class, I feel like I'm indoctrinated into this again, again, yeah. every day. Um, what is it like teaching film on Zoom? Do you like it? Is there any part of it that you like? Is there any uh, that's a good question um I, no uh you know for, for, for my <laughs> no. for my colleagues for my colleagues who teach directing you know production that's a real challenge but for those of us who teach screenwriting it actually has worked out pretty well you know we basically sit inside a room and write and so how how different is it you know than what we do when we're in class together workshops everybody's on screen right read pages we do table reads so everybody gets to participate that way um i've found actually that it's been quite productive i did an entire mfa class three quarters where i never once met these people in person but that group really bonded and um they have a remarkable connection which i'm sure is going to continue for many of them for the rest of their lives so uh, it has its challenges, yes, but again, because we're talking story and it's screenwriters and we're not involved in production and it's, right. it's table reads, it's workshopping, it's worked out really well, I think. No, it's that, that well, I mean, from my experience as a student, I feel like that's absolutely true. Like it's not, for my writing classes, you know, because again, like you said, it's, it's talking, it's communicating, it's conveying ideas the best way that you can to one another um what what was the 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 mfa class that you were talking about what was like the subject of that class well it's where they develop a thesis script um and so it's three quarters long uh, thesis one is story development and uh, that's a class that when i first came to depaul uh, i recommended that we develop a class at the undergraduate and then subsequently graduate level where the students spent an entire quarter developing a story and starting with a lot of work on character. And so uh, the thesis one class is that where their goal by the end of the quarter is to have created a scene by scene uh, outline for either a thesis feature uh, film script or a thesis TV pilot script. But they spent a lot of time working on character and a lot of time working with things like synopses and treatments, basically building out their story to the point, breaking stories, what we call it in Hollywood, you break the story. Yeah. So that's what thesis one is. Thesis two is where the students write the first draft of their scripts. And the TV writers have an additional wrinkle there because they will finish their scripts, particularly the half hour people, well in advance of the feature film people. So we've added a component whereby they they will write up and create a pitch deck, which is becoming increasingly popular in Hollywood, where it's not just going in and verbally pitching something, but you present a visual element. I think for TV, this is becoming increasingly valuable. Yeah. And then in thesis three, they rewrite the script. Now they're getting feedback along the way from their thesis committee members and their cohort, and obviously me or the other faculty members leading the students. But thesis three, they rewrite the script. And again, for the TV people, because they're going to finish their scripts earlier than the feature people, they then put together a series Bible, 
So for TV, they end up with a fully rewritten script, a pitch deck, and a thesis, I mean, a series Bible. So that, as part of their portfolio, is a very comprehensive way in which they can go and present their original TV series. And the feature film people end up with a fully, you know, fleshed out, revised feature film script. So it's very intense. Uh, it's a it's a uh, week by week process. They go through a grind of essentially 30 weeks, you know, mm-hmm. taking a story from concept all the way through the rewrite. And, and part of the learning process is that grind, like learning to just do the work when you don't feel like doing the work, uh, doing the work when you're questioning your whether the decisions you're making are right or not, um, and working with a cohort and, and creating that writer's room environment. So that's what the thesis MFA thesis experience is, at least in terms of the thesis script. Well, wow. Uh, then no, that, 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 that is, that is an amazing experience because I mean, that's, yeah, that, that the amount of discipline because, I mean, because all writers, I mean, I think Ernest Hemingway said it best. All writers need two things. They need discipline and they need luck. And I guess by luck, I would say that's inspiration or like ideas. Like they just need that, mm-hmm. that facet of themselves going. Like, and, 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 that, and that process, because obviously when you're writing a script by yourself, you know, you know being an accomplished screenwriter yourself, the only way to get it done is through consistency and just throwing yourself at it, even on days when you don't want to throw yourself at it, however difficult that may be. Um, do you ever, do you ever find it, do you ever meet screenwriters who go, who go into this MFA program, for the screenwriter particularly, and they don't have the discipline or they find it hard to find that? Is that, is that, and do you do anything about that? Like where, like how does, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, every writer's different. And every story is different. So it's a challenge. And some of the writers have more of an extensive background writing. Some of the writers in the program have actually, it's a second career thing. They maybe spent five years doing something else, but, but really felt like this was a call that they need a need to respond to. Some writers come straight out of college. And so every writer is different. And that's one of the challenges when you're a teacher is to meet each student where they are. We have a a saying in the DePaul MFA program for screenwriting, which is learn your craft, find your voice, make your mark. And so they're going to learn, our students come out of the MFA program, they're going to, they're going to know the ins and outs of screenwriting theory and understand story structure and writing that is going to translate into something that they could do if they move to LA or work in the mainstream commercial realm of TV or film. So we wanna position them there to do that. But then in terms of finding their voice, that's where that one-on-one relationship with the individual students can come in. Um, you know, It's very important to dig down and, and learn more about each student, what their backgrounds are, what their unique ex- life experience is, that they can then build on that and develop their ability to connect with their voice, develop their voice, because that's really important uh, in in the film and TV business. Like on the TV side of things, showrunners will often tell you they're looking for writers with that unique voice. Even if it's a pre-existing show and they want to know that the writers can actually write the characters that exist on that show, they Mm -hmm. still want the, the writers to come in with the unique life experience and perception that they can then bring to the story generating ideas, you know, like sitting in the writer's room and coming up with ideas for the next season or whatnot. Um, And then make your mark. So we provide means by which people can go out to LA and and transition into the business. But yeah, the discipline is is absolutely a part of it. I am a strong proponent and, and I'm on my students to write every day. You know, I've interviewed probably over 200 screenwriters you know through my blog go into the story and that's a consistent thing that's a consistent thing you you know now there are some writers who don't but a lot of them just say you gotta write every day 
you keep that momentum going. You get into a habit so that anybody who's been, you know, exercises has gotten over that hump where they're like, they exercise on a regular basis, understands that, that if you, if you take a day off, well, okay, that's, that's okay. You take two days off. Now, all of a sudden your body is starting to fail. Well, you take three days off and it's like, maybe you're starting over again. So yeah, we really, really, or I can just say myself, I, I'm, I really encourage people to, to, to write every day, you know, and, and they need to look no further than my blog, which I blogged apart from when I had uh, shoulder surgery and couldn't for two months. I've blogged every day since I, I launched the, the blog in 2008. So uh, it's an important thing. You know, if you can, if you can have that capability of putting your ass on chair and sitting down and writing when you just are not feeling it, even if you can write one scene, then then you're you're the better for it as a writer. I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, momentum is is one of those. Yeah, momentum is that, that that's it. It's so hard when you lose it and you have to get it back. That's why it's so important to keep it because it, it's right. Like as a writer, because I mean, the, the, I mean, I'll admit this has happened to me. Uh, I've like, say if I've gone through a script and I've written a good script and I've rewritten it and it's gone good. And then I don't know what to write next. And I think about it for a little bit and then maybe a week, a few weeks goes by. Yeah, I've been writing things here and there, but I haven't seriously sat down and like really dived into a story. It's almost like you have to kind of relearn some things again when you go into the next story. Do you, I mean, will you write, like, say if you, if you after you finish writing a screenplay, a feature or, or a TV pilot, do you, even if you're still thinking about what the next thing to write, do you just write like short stories or little things anyway, just to fill that void so you're still writing, even though you don't have necessarily the next idea for the next big thing? Well, so this is where writers are in a unique position. You know, if you're a film director, uh, you know, I suppose if you're at an A level, you can stack projects up, right? Actors may be the same thing, but writers can, can do that. Writers can stack projects up. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just be, you're in Hollywood, you land a gig, you get done with the gig and you're like, what's next? And then you've got to try and land another gig and spend six months doing that. What you'd like to do ideally is you've got this gig and another gig and another gig lined up and you can stack projects. That's what I call stacking projects. So for example, and I've had this where I've had three projects at once. And the way that I've handled that is in an ideal world, it's like this. Uh, you're working in the morning on a script that you're writing that first draft. You're working in the afternoon on a project where you're doing research and breaking story. And then at night, you're rewriting the, that third project. Now, let's assume that you're not yet established in the business. There's no reason why you can't do that same approach and start developing those chops as a professional writer, the ability to stack projects. So this becomes really important to avoid that thing where you're like, okay, I'm done now. What do I do next? No, you've already got multiple story concepts that you've been developing beforehand. You've written up treatments, you know, one, two, three page treatments for a variety of projects. And as you're working on one thing um, that, that, you're, that you're knocking out, you're, you're writing that draft, well, you're researching the other one. You're doing character development, you're doing story development. And then maybe you're even rewriting something. And so you get into a flow where, now, let me just say parenthetically, some writers can't do that, and there's no shame in that. They they can only focus on one story at a time. That that there's no problem on that. I mean, that's just in that case, it would be it would be helpful for them to have that next thing in mind that they're ready to jump into, as opposed to having that pause that you were talking about, mm -hmm. where they don't know what they're going to write. Right. But this is why it's absolutely critical. Let me make this point because this is, I think, something that that our current situation. Uh, in Hollywood is, is, is really driving home this point. You've got to come at it with strong story concepts. 
you've got to have strong story concepts. So what do I mean by that? And why is that so important nowadays? Now, when I broke in, it was it was important because it was like the realm of high concepts, where you come up with these ideas that, you know, were easily marketable and uh, like my movie Canine, you know, uh, loner cop, new partner, police dog. Boom, you know, you see the movie. We kind of thought drifted away from that a little bit, maybe in the 2000s, that the first decade. But now, because Hollywood is so obsessed with pre-existing content, reboots, remakes, sequels, prequels, sequels, female versions of you know movies that right, yeah, they they feel it's safer that way, and I think they've got numbers to prove that those projects actually make more money for them, and so if you're coming in with an original idea, you're you're swimming upstream against the, the, the instincts of the buyers, which is why, coming back, it's important to have a strong story concept. Now, what do I mean by that? It's not necessarily a high concept, though that can be helpful. Something where you've got that, that, that conceit, that simple idea that the buyer's company can use to market, to break through the noise of the advertising world Consumers just bombarded by uh, people promoting their various products and whatnot. You know, the competition is not just movies and TV. It's TikTok. It's YouTube. It's, you know, uh, all the various social media. It's, it's everything that's out there. That strong story concept, it can, it can be very helpful if you've got that, that, that central conceit, like Groundhog Day. It's someone trapped in a recurring loop, right? Mm -hmm. That very simple thing. But it's also, I think, helpful if it's got some reference point to a successful movie or TV series. Now, that idea, for example, for Groundhog Day, we've now seen multiple movies come out with that same conceit. Palm Springs, same conceit. The difference there, it's not just one character, it's two, actually three, if you include the uh, J.K. Simmons character. Um, there's a horror movie called Happy Death Day. Same conceit. Say a little of the same thing, yeah. Right? There's the TV series Russian Doll. Same conceit. So Hollywood has always operated with a similar but different. So a strong story concept to me is got three components. One, if you can have that, 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 that thing, that one conceit that if you're in a bar in Los Feliz and the producer says, what are you writing? Oh, you're a writer. What are you writing? And you give them just that, that thing, you know? And they go, oh, yeah, I get it. Okay, so that's one part of it. The other part, another part of it is if it's got some association to a preceding project that Hollywood has put out, TV or film, that has been successful, but it's different than that. And then the third thing is for me, and this is critically important, is the characters. You got to have strong characters, particularly a protagonist that you see their journey is going to be meaningful. It's going to have some depth to it. It's going to be something that an actor would want to play that you could see uh, audiences identifying with and having an emotional response. So when, this is a long way to answer, I'm sorry, but no, when great. you're in a situation where you're working on a project, you should be constantly trying to find other story ideas. And just the more ideas you have, the better. Just put them down into a file, but you're looking for the strongest ones that you can use and develop because you know again it's 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 tough out there you know for for people with original content to get those things made nowadays yeah no that's that is that's amazing advice all around when when a student when a screenwriting student comes to you and says um i'm having i'm having trouble uh, thinking of ideas, think, think of good ideas, ideas that I think could really work and really sell. What, what, what do you advise them to do in that scenario? Um, so I do this thing on my blog. I just, I just started it uh, about a month and a half ago. Sundays with Stephen King's on writing, his memoir on writing. Yeah. And it just so happens this week dealt with that very question. His, 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 uh, the, I'm paraphrasing his quote. He says, there's no idea stack. There's no, you know, 
uh, stash of bestseller ideas. He says, ideas kind of sail by you, you know, where you put this together with that, which would never have been put together before. And the, the, the issue for the writer is not to try to generate them. It's just to find them, to be aware, to have that consciousness. And I think that's true that basically story ideas are everywhere. They're happening all the time for young people who are much more connected to social media and you know, click, 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 click. They just see so much content over the course of the day. I encourage them to think about, you know, your brain's got maybe like eight tracks. One track should always be like, is it a story? Is it a movie? Is it a TV series? So like every April, for example, on my blog, I do a series called a story idea each day for a month. And over the course of the year, I just, whenever I see a newspaper article, I go, oh, that's got an inter that's got that conceit. That's got that hook. I'm going to flag it. I'm going to put it in my, my story idea file. Then during April, every day, I'll go through my files and go, oh, okay, this one's interesting. Like for today, for example, the story that I, uh, I used for that, that uh, uh, blog post was, what if... A 90-year-old grandfather came out of the closet and revealed he was gay. He'd been living his entire life, adult life, including getting married and fathering in this case. This actually happened in mm -hmm. Colorado. Yeah. Fathered a daughter. And it was on his like 90th birthday that he came out and said, I'm gay. He, he had a backstory where he'd actually fallen in love with a guy 60, 70 years ago. But back then it was just really tough to be in a gay relationship a, and, and he couldn't face that. And so went away from that, but that was a part of him that had been, he'd been in denial of publicly his entire life. And so imagine that, what, what would that do to, you know, fictionalize that? What would that do to adult kids, to grandkids, to family, to friends, to the little town in which this guy is known as a trusted friend and you know, that sort of thing. That's just a, that's an interesting conceit. Ninety year old guy reveals he's gay. When when, when you, higher, sorry, sorry what, go ahead. no 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 problem. When you say conceit, is that just does that just mean jumping off point? Does that just mean like hook? Yeah, basically hook, the yeah. nugget that 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 one thing yeah. about it. It's it's not you know when people say well high concept is like a story that can be summed up in you know one or two lines, you know, and I think that's fairly helpful but what i'm talking about is that thing that if again you're in the bar in right. santa monica california sure. the producer or development executive or manager or an agent oh so you're a screenwriter what are you working on and you're going to tell them this little summary thing like five seconds ten seconds and their head's going to go like this oh yeah they they, they it's it they can see it they can get it so no not every writer is going to think like that. You know, a lot of writers are going to come at it more from a character perspective. You know, there's no right way to do this. But in terms of original story content um, and writing those spec scripts, if you can have that, you know, it even works for TV, right? The Good Place. You know, what if someone went to The yeah. Good Place, but it was an accident? Right. See what I'm saying? Really reduce it down, you know. So yeah, um, that that's that's some advice. The, the, your question, it's not so much necessarily about generating story ideas, though I do know writers who do that, and I've done that. Where you sit down and you say, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna think see. of an idea. I'm gonna think real hard about what. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it really? Or, yeah. But what I'm saying is, they're there all day long, just coming across your timeline on your social media and the news. There's stories out there all the time. It's just having that one track of your mind conscious of that oh, again Stephen King the issue is just finding them they're there you know no I, I I think that's definitely true and have you have you ever read the the book um Big Magic by um I, Elizabeth Gilbert she's the author of <laughs> E Pray Love yeah right, yeah I haven't uh, read it no uh it's I mean it's very interesting and honestly it, it helped me a lot just to conceptualize how I guess inspiration works, um, and she and she, you know, describes you know, I ideas coming to you in very much the same way. It's like it's not, 
many times it's not you intellectually like conjuring it up or like formulating it it's just like you notice something or like you or like you know you think back to like a situation that happened or something and you're like wow that was a really intense situation or like a disagreement or argument or you remember a person from your life who was just weird like had a weird personality but you're like that could be an interesting protagonist or antagonist or something like that it's like it's the the stuff's all, all around you but like you said it's not it's not i think sometimes writers and i, mean, I don't know maybe you'll agree or disagree but like sometimes writers think we're so smart we intellectually come up with all of this stuff hmm. a lot of times we just kind of stumble upon things absolutely uh, what you were just talking to mind brings uh, talking about brings to mind uh, a quote from uh, Nora and Julie Efron's mother. I, I don't remember her name, but she basically said, everything is copy. Mm. You know, like from a journalistic yeah. standpoint, everything, everything that happens in your life is copy, is potential. And so there are, I think, a lot of writers that do come at it from that perspective, where they, they're looking at their own personal life experience and generating story ideas off that. The advantage of that, I mean, there's a lot of advantages, obviously. But one of the most important ones is that you've got a personal, you as a writer have got a personal connection to the story, right? Right. It's like, I'm a huge Pixar fan, like a freak. I mean, I just, oh, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm yeah, they're fascinated right. by that. And so, for example, if you look at a movie like Inside Out, that had its roots in Pete Doctor's own life experience, where he was family moved from a home where he was very comfortable, a place, to a place where he was a complete like fish out of water. And that's the start of that. You know, what is that experience like? That sense of being alienated, disconnected from your home, alienated from this new place. And that, you know, led all the way to Riley and that whole thing. So, um, so there's that. But then, you know, I think there's another point here, which, which you were making in a way was that the subconscious right you know yeah definitely you're, you're taking a walk you're in the shower you're doing something completely unrelated to writing and then whoa where'd that come from i love those moments i love i i feel like as a writer that's what you live for you live for I, 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 other than just the actual writing of it it's like when you're just like you're just thinking about it and then it's just like you never expected it to hit you in that moment like it did, but then it does. And you're like, I can't even explain what just happened. <laughs> I so, can't explain well, it. So I, I did, I moderated this panel uh, over the weekend for the Screencraft Writers Summit. And one of the panelists was uh, Rodney Barnes, who is, uh, wrote for the Boondocks and Everybody Hates Chris. But he's also been involved writing comic books and graphic novels. And he was a huge fan of this TV show from the 70s, late 70s, uh, called Night Stalker, which was this fun, um, like a journalist guy tracking down these uh, demons and vampires and werewolves and stuff. Uh, you know, I think it was in Seattle, as I recall. Yeah. And so he always knew that he wanted to do a TV, or I'm sorry, a, a story about cops and vampires, right? So that was just sitting around in his mind. Mm -hmm. cut to him sometime later he goes to see hamilton he joked that uh that somebody in this you know on the on the uh the crew of hamilton must have built a wing of their house how many times he's been to see hamilton <sighs> but you know he's there for like the sixth time watching this play and for some reason when the king when king george comes out and there's a song that he sings when he learns that John Adams is going to become the new president. I know the song very well. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a Hamilton nerd, a Hamilton nerd myself, yes. Yeah, so yeah, and you, <laughs> you know that King George is making fun of John Adams. He's yes. thinking this guy's basically a- He's no know, George Washington, you know. No George Washington. Right. And this is what Rodney said was going through his mind. Now, five times he's seen this play and it never hit him until this time. It's like his subconscious was ready for it at this moment, saying, this is what he went. What if John Adams was in the audience and he heard this song, 
heard him being humiliated from on stage, how would he feel about that? How angry would that make him? And it suddenly dawned on him, John Adams, vampire. <laughs> and so he literally he, <laughs> he wrote a graphic. He wrote a graphic novel, which is now being developed as a TV series called Philadelphia, like Philadelphia. No Philadelphia, way. Colon, <laughs> sins of, the sins of the father, in which the nemesis character is John Adams, who you know went to the Caribbean and came out of there a, a vampire, and now it's 200 years later, and here he is, John Adams, because he's now a powerful guy and he wants to take over the world. <laughs> but it, it was interesting that five times he saw Hamilton, six times for some reason, again, subconscious going on there. John Adams, vampire. John Adams. You wouldn't put those vampire. two things in. That goes back to Stephen King, right? Two things you would not normally put together, and then you put them together, and all of a sudden, boom, you got a story. Right. That's 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 hilarious. That's, that's hilarious. Yeah, that was hilarious. <laughs> and cool and everything. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's fascinating. That's being developed right now. I can't wait to see that. I'm gonna check that out when that comes yeah, that, out. It's a it's a six part multi uh, graphic novel which i read it's really great and it's being developed as a tv series yeah is it i mean does it get cheesy like is it a comedy like 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 what is no it? no no it's 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 a dark you know graphic novel i mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah it's yeah. great the 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 story really isn't i mean that's the plot line the right. vampire stuff yeah the story that the the emotional core of the story it's a father-son thing Right. There's a there's a cop, a legendary cop in Philadelphia, who um, is murdered. His son, and he had a tough. The son had a tough. The protagonist is the son. The son had a, a fractured relationship with his father and left Philadelphia to go off to some small town. And he himself is a cop. Yeah. So you can tell that there's there's conflict there. On the one hand, he leaves his father, so there's there's tension. You know that. But and yet he follows in the same footsteps as his father. So you see that the, the characters got what I call disunity, these disunity elements. He comes back to Philadelphia to try and figure out what the heck happened to his father and how he's murdered. Well, as it turns out, his father is also now a vampire. And they are together trying to solve this thing while the father's trying to resist the vampire thing. So it's a father-son relationship. That's the emotional core of it. But the you know the the ape the plot line is the whole vampire trying to take over the world type thing. So um, yeah, no that I'm gonna check that out. Can can I, can I find Philadelphia? Philadelphia. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm, I'm gonna look at yeah I'm gonna look that up. You 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 said before I go on you you talked about character unity and disunity. Could you just explain that? All right. So I'm writing this book. For Palgrave Macmillan, okay. Um, I, I I had no intention of writing uh, this book, but once I started teaching in film school and I was reading through the curriculum at various film schools around the country and a few universities for undergraduate level, and just looking at the books that they were using in class, I was I was rather disappointed to see that the books they were using that I was familiar with uh, tend to focus on story structure as plot there's very little attention paid to character mm -hmm. where in my whole thing is character driven storytelling that you start with i might have a mantra begin with character end with character find the story in between yeah. so it's it's no, all I'm... about grounding the story in the character and then seeing where again it's their story they know it better than you they exist you know, and so reach out to them, find that stuff, and then see where the story evolves. So most stories, Hollywood movies, mainstream commercial movies, and frankly, most independent movies have what I call a unity arc, where the protagonist starts off in a state of disunity, and they move toward a state of unity. Now, there are stories where the protagonist doesn't change. They're change agents like Wally -E or, or Forrest Gump. Mm -hmm. um, there are movies and stories where the protagonist refuses to change, so it's a tragedy. Well, maybe not necessarily like Nomadland, a fern refuses to change. And so we do, it's a bittersweet ending. You know, she, she, she has an opportunity to basically find a home, but she, and 
I mean, it's laid out right there for her, spoiler alert, but in the end, she chooses to stay a nomad. And so you're left with a very mixed feeling about it, but it's not a, not a typical happy ending. Right. Um, there are stories where the protagonist goes through a disintegration. They go through a negative arc like Charles Foster Kane or Travis Bickle in, uh, in Taxi Driver. But by and large, because Hollywood likes happy endings because they know that people like happy endings and then they yeah. walk out of a movie theater and they're chattering happily about the thing that's going to create more by word of mouth. That unity arc is more typical of what we would see. So the language system, this is my language system. It's going in my book. I've been using it for years. The idea that the protagonist at the beginning of the story is in a state of disunity. They imagine their life before fade in. They've cobbled together a life. It's, uh, you know, they may feel like they're succeeding and, and, and this is the life they're supposed to be leading. But in point of fact, it's not the life they're supposed to have. Right. So they, they, Campbell, they need to go on. They, they need that story journey. to go. Yes, that journey. They need the journey. They've got to go on this journey. You know, Joseph Campbell and the hero's journey talks about how at the beginning, they're just making do. They need to change. Those are direct quotes from Joseph Campbell talking to Bill Moyers about the state of the hero or heroine at the beginning of the story. And so they are in a state of disunity. Why? Because they are disconnected from their authentic nature. It's inside. Yeah. It's already there. Dor remember in Wizard of Oz, Dorothy, you've always had the power to go home. She, right. al she always knew that this place was her home. She just didn't feel like it at that moment. She had to go on the journey in order to realize something that was inside her already. And so that's the protagonist's story. Now, this, this is where I get into Carl Jung, who is the founder of analytical psychology, and he talks about this. He has this great quote where he says, when, a, when an inner situation is not made conscious, and by situation, he's talking about conflict or tension, right. the universe creates circumstances which compel them to. So it's like, that's the protagonist story. The protagonist is sitting there in a state of disunity, the, what we call the inciting incident or Campbell would call the call to adventure. That's not random. That's specifically tied to the protagonist and the journey they need to go on. The journey they go on is the one they need to go on. It's very specific. It's not something that could have happened two months ago. It's not something that happened, could have happened two years ago. It's right, right. now. It needs to happen right now. Yes. It needs to happen right now. And so that journey, they're in a state of disunity. They're disconnected from whatever you want to call it, authentic nature, true self, core essence, ultimate need. You're really going to dig deep, deep down these layers to find that thing inside that is the thing that needs to, for Jung, emerge into the light of consciousness. It's been in the, in the dark corners of the inner psyche. And so, you know, if you think about the story psychologically, it's, it's pretty logical, really. They start off with these old ways of being, these beliefs and behaviors, these coping skills and defense mechanisms. Again, they've cobbled together a life. They're just making do. They need to change. Boom. Universe says, nope, you can't stay here. You can't keep doing this. You got to change. And now you're going to be pulled out of your old world into the new world, right? Even if you don't go anyplace geographically, your old world has changed because something's happened. So you were in a new world experience, right? Right. So now, now you're on that journey. Yeah. And that first part, the first half of the journey is now the protagonist is out there in this new faces, new places. They don't know the rules. They don't know the customs. And all these challenges and tests are coming their way, including trying to figure out who of these characters they're meeting as a potential ally or enemy. What they're discovering is that their old ways of being, their old habits, their old perceptions are not working out here. They worked back fine in the old place, but not out here. And I call that deconstruction. So it's, again, it's logical. It's like if they have to change and end up in a state of unity, they've got to have their old ways of being set aside, broken down, pushed away, so that it's maybe experienced by the protagonist as a negative. It's actually a positive, net positive. Why? Because now that their defense mechanisms are broken away, that authentic nature can start to bubble up can start to rise up from inside. And then they start to tap into that. Typically there's like a transition point, a big challenge or event in the middle where it's like, whoa, what, what was that? 
as opposed to surviving by luck in the first half of Act Two, they're now, wow, that, and so now they're empowered. In that second half of Act Two, I call it reconstruction because they're no longer relying on their old ways of being. There's this new thing that's emerging, you know, like Luke Skywalker, the Force. I really do feel something there, you know, that the Force is inside him, right? And so that second half of Act Two, all the challenges and the characters they meet are facilitating their growth where they embrace this new way of being. Now there's a big reversal at the end of Act Two, just from dramatic purposes. We want that thing where it looks like they're gonna succeed, but then it falls away. My, my favorite example of that is a Pixar movie, Up. Up has one of the best all is lost moments in uh, cinema, as far as I'm concerned. Carl Fredrickson, disunity. He's disconnected, his wife has died. He's stringing out the days of his life a lonely old guy who has no friends. He's in this house, all these memories of his wife, Ellie. And, you know, he's a lifeless individual, life hyphenless individual. Mm -hmm. Knock, knock, knock. Meaning, Mr. Fredrickson, I'm here to, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's, it's, it's the universe on. sending him the thing that he needs to, to change then, that, that's inside of him. That's, that's, that's it's locked down when he gets into that altercation and now he's got to move out of the house into the old folks home. No, not going to do that. He realizes, he remembers, I made that promise to Ellie to take her to Paradise Falls. I'm going to do that, the balloon house. And so off he goes, but knock, knock, knock. Sorry, Mr. Fredericks, <laughs> I'm here. And Russell's there. Russell absolutely is a replacement for Ellie. That's his whole story is about finding the ability to a rediscover his his his, his uh, ability to uh, adventure. He was as a kid. He, he was a huge fan of Charles Muntz, you know. Um, but to find a connection with Russell, find a connection with Doug, find a connection with Kevin, a surrogate family to revitalize him. Right. That all his lost moment is great. What does he want? His conscious goal. He wants to get the house atop Paradise Falls to fulfill the promise he made to Ellie. What does he need? Well, he actually needs to be done with that adventure and to start a new one and one with these these characters well so all is lost if you recall is where Muntz has trapped Kevin in a net and the house is on fire and so Carl has got a choice is he going to fulfill the promise he made to Russell that he will help get Kevin back to the brood the Kevin's babies or is he going to save the house what does he do he saves the house Muntz takes Kevin crushes Russell's spirit because he's breaking this, Carl broken this promise to, to Russell. He pulls the house up to Paradise Falls. He has achieved his want, his conscious goal. But it's a Pyrrhic victory. It's an empty victory. Russell's all upset. He's sitting there. He's got the adventure book with Ellie and looking at these pictures and just feeling horrible because it's an empty thing. And then he sees these photos where he realizes that she's taken all these photos of their lives together. And of course, she gives him the benediction. We've already had a great adventure. Now go have a new one, right? And so off he goes to yes. save Russell. And Russell's going to go save Kevin. Yeah. So there, but that all is lost moment, right? Big reversal. It's basically saying to the, to the protagonist, who are you? Who are you? And what Carl decides is, I am no longer bound to the strictures. Ellie has given me the freedom to go forward. And I am a father, surrogate father to Russell. And off he goes. So that's reconstruction. He's getting in touch with his spirit of adventure. He's getting in touch with his ability, Carl, to connect with other people. To you know, Doug is a mentor. I just met you, but I love you. The ability to love. He's teaching Carl that you do have the capacity for love, even though you feel like it's all gone because of Ellie's death. And then that Act Three for any story that you do is basically building toward the final struggle. The final struggle, the culmination of the movie. You know, from a plotline standpoint, it's the big finale. From a psychological standpoint, it's saying, it's asking, and we're looking at this. Has the protagonist learned what they need to learn? Have they learned intellectual wisdom from the mentor? Have they learned emotional wisdom from the attractor? Have they learned what this thing is that's bubbling inside and they, have they fully embraced it and has it reconfigured them so they're seeing the world and living in the world in a different way? It also empowers them. It gives them strength. So it's so living that, that, their that, authenticity. 
they're living that psychologically they've now moved toward wholeness uh, like carl jung says they have now embraced their authentic nature that story is like we see it replicated over and over and over again and you know mo endless variations on theme but it's a wonderful uplifting you know story that i think we like to we want to believe that we can change we can be better we can get in touch with who we are and live an authentic life so that's the disunity to you say my long sermon for you on it but that no that was that was like a master class for there um that was no that was great i will definitely have to rewatch up after that explanation great um, movie it's no it's great movie. I mean, well yeah and pixar in general inside we were you, you were talking about inside out before inside out was a big one for me just because i well i, I watched it when did that movie when did that film come out like that came out about five years ago maybe five, something like that i can't remember yeah yeah five years so that would have been around me transitioning from high school to college so i guess in a way it hit me deeply because i could relate to what riley felt like riley was yeah. comfortable and now she's being thrust into a new environment and there's trepidation there and i was and i was feeling that same way and and just the way that what were you saying well i was just gonna say that uh on this panel I did this weekend, one of the panelists was Meg LaFoe, who co-wrote it. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, Inside Out. And um, that, you know, Pixar does not make movies. They make movies where there are specific points of emotional connection. And so you've got that story of Riley being uprooted. Well, every one of us in some ways, I would imagine, has felt like a stranger at some point or felt like yes. we're we're not comfortable here right it's also very fundamentally about your feelings are not bad you can feel feelings even if they are painful and that's okay right and yes. so if you look at that story joy is the protagonist of that story and that storyline and uh, i talked with meg about this when we had that that session you know, one of the best questions you can ask is this question that Robert Towns, screenwriter Robert Towns says, ask your character, what do they fear the most? What are they really afraid of? And Joy believes that Riley should never feel sad. She should always feel happy. She's like a parent figure for Riley. But that's a blind spot for her. She's disconnected from a the ability to feel sad. Remember that scene where she's with the wagon and she's in that pit and it looks like she's never going to get out of there and she has that ball and she cries? Yeah. That's the breakthrough. And so I asked Beck, I said, is Joy afraid not only that Riley will feel sad, but is she really more deeply, that deepest need, is she really more deeply afraid that she will feel sad? Joy. And, she, and she's Joy. And 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 Meg said, absolutely. That's that. She needed to feel that sadness and then survive that feeling and realize, you know what? It's not gonna slay me. You know, it's 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 and then of course she sees that in that ball that that sad thing and happy thing just happened like like that. You know, she's uh, Riley's sad because the hockey team lost, but then she rolls it forward and then the girls come and pick her up and she's happy so you can you can make those transitions so um yes i just think that's really important to look at your characters particularly your protagonists and identify those disunity elements because that's that's like an eight the story man <laughs> it's just like they're in everything you know yeah but well it's just in the, the hero's journey arc it's it resonates so well it's be that's because that's how we view what it, it's like in real life to overcome adversity. Like you are denying yourself something, whether it's because you don't feel like you deserve it or you feel unworthy or you're content in your situation. And then 
there's this disunity because you're denying your authentic self. And then you then go on a story uh, or a journey that illuminates that so much and it brings you to your to your greatest fears and then you survive your greatest fears and that allows you to become the hero and then that's your way to unity right i feel like campbell talks about campbell talks about the ultimate dragon is within with is is within you yes dragon is a metaphor for that which you know the, the fear that you the deepest fear and of course we try to avoid that you know because it's scary Yes. Like Clarice Starling in Silence of the Lambs. You know, she doesn't want to deal with those feelings associated with her father's death and being on that Montana farm and trying to run away with the lamb. The lamb is metaphor for her father. She's trying to save her father, but he was so heavy. He was so heavy. And so she doesn't want to go there. But Lecter knew that immediately when he met her. He knew that this woman is in a state of disunity and I am the perfect guy. To bring right. He's the perfect guy to bring her to, you know, again, faith. He is the perfect guy. He's a mentor. He's not the bad guy in the movie. He's actually a mentor who guides Clarice down into her her inner psyche uh, to tap into that fear and survive that. So I think you're exactly right. I mean, Campbell talks about the hero's journey being not a journey of attainment, but reattainment. It's reconnecting with something. It's already there inside. And so, you know, the journey is is as a metaphor for our lives. And so each of us, yeah, every challenge we face. You know, if we're open to it, is an opportunity to explore our own psychological makeup and see if we can somehow tap more into who we are. Yeah. Wow. I said that. I just gotta let that simmer in for a second. Um, do you, Do you think that? Do you think all all story comes from that? Comes from that place of I mean, how many? Because there's there's always that there's always that like idea that there's like really only seven type or seven or something types of stories, and Shakespeare discovered like five of them. Like there's always like there's always that phrase. Do you believe in that? Do you think that that has any relevance or is real? I don't know. I mean, honestly, that doesn't even concern me. I mean, with my students and my own teaching and writing, I'm much more about, okay, you've got this protagonist. Let's, let's dive in. Let's, 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 let's dive in and find out who, the, let's get curious. Let's yes. ask questions. Let's see who they, uh, Meg LaFoe uh, had this great, I'm gonna, I, I said, I'm going to ibid this at every time <laughs> I mention this. She talks about the process of digging into your characters like there's this lava inside, right? Yeah. And what does lava want to do? It wants to burst out, right? Right. Like a volcano. It wants to come into the light of consciousness, Pearl Jung. So our task as writers Per Meg, this is such a brilliant idea. I mean, it's such a great metaphor. Is we're digging down through the layers of sediment. Each layer is a layer of psychological compensation, of coping skills and defense mechanisms, and everything else that the that the character has created to avoid to repress the, the lava. But we dig down, dig, 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 dig with all the time, all these questions pushing further and further what does your care what do they need what do they need use that as a diamond tip drill until you hit the lava right that's the ultimate need that's what needs to emerge that's the raw stuff that drives that character and it drives everything else if you can determine what that character needs at their deepest level and you know that it's a unity arc then everything else is going to flow from that. So I don't know whether there's seven or 33 or whatever many stories there are. You know, I do know that, you know, from the disunity to unity, that's a very common psychological uh, arc, you know, a journey that characters take and that there have been 
literally millions of stories that have been told that feature that dynamic. And they're all the same and they're all different, you know? And so I just, to me, it's much more just about, I don't even think like that. I think, you know, maybe in the past I would have, but I just, to me, it's about engaging the characters, you know? And so then you're, you're living with them and all of a sudden, oh, this character, that character is going to provide opposition to the protagonist. They, they, they have, the protagonist wants this, but this character, I, I come up, they're going to want that same thing, but they're going to want it for a different reason, or they're going to want to stop the protagonist from achieving that goal. All right, well, then, then I say to my, like myself or my students, well, that's interesting. That sounds like a nemesis figure, an antagonist figure. Well, now go spend some time with that character. Look at the world through that character's eyes as if they were the protagonist, right? Mm -hmm. And from the nemesis perspective, they are their own protagonist, right? What, as you start to get curious about them and digging down toward their lava, what if you notice something like this? They actually inhabit the, the, the aspects of what the protagonist fears the most, that the nemesis is actually the physicalization of what Jung calls the shadow. Right, the darker impulses. Now you've got a really interesting situation. It's no longer just a good guy versus a bad guy. It's the protagonist facing someone who basically physicalizes the very thing they fear the most. And whatever plot you come up with, that's just some good stuff, right? Yeah. It's like, okay, now we got a cycle, you know, Buffalo Bill in, in, in Silence of the Lambs represents the guys who killed her dad, the boogeyman, boogeyman, you know. And so she's got to face that guy down in order to redeem herself, you know. So anyhow, I just, I don't even think about it like, you know, these forms or whatever. I just know that the, the psychological stuff is really, it's, it's, it's exciting. It's, it's a great way to approach storytelling, I think. I, yeah, to me, I've always been the kind of writer personally that, I, it's always amazes me because it always seems like there's, there's writers who are, um, they, they, we, we enter into the story a different way. Like, like we'll all get to the finish line and produce a story, but we enter in at different points. It tends to be usually writers enter from the point of view of character or they enter into the point of view of world. Like what's the world? Like, what is this place that I'm building? Uh, I've always lent towards the side of characters because to me, if I have a character that I'm really into that compels me, that I think just has a great thing going on and a, and just a has a potential problem or obstacle or disunity, as you say, that would that just gets me excited. And that and then I can make a world that best challenges that character. Because then that's not hard to figure out from that point, what the world should be. Um, do, you, yeah. do you do you go at it either way? Is there a way that you prefer or do you sometimes switch it up? I don't know. Oh, well, you know, every story is different. Again, I don't, I'm not, I'm not a big guy on rules. I don't, I don't you know, I just don't. I don't me, I don't me, me, that's, me neither. That's, but sometimes you yeah. just feel like you got to ask. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. Um, you know, I mean, I, I would say my general thing is, uh, is characters, you know. Um, I'm I'm now now that I'm finishing this book for Palgrave Macmillan, I'm I'm free to re write fiction again, and uh, after 18 months of that uh, process, and so I'm 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 now working with characters, starting with a, a, a idea that I think is going to become a novel. I've never written a novel, so that's exciting. And oh, that's fun. Scary. Yeah. But uh, and I've never written in this particular space, so again, it's like okay. But it's like you said, I'm compelled by the characters. There's a set of characters that are in a situation that I feel, I feel for them. And it's, I'm not sure how the thing's going to be resolved, but they're in a, they're in a situation that feels unresolvable. But um, anyhow, so, so yeah, characters, but then there may be times where I'm like, maybe there's a theme, you know, or maybe there's a scene, a moment, you know, um, 
I'm a huge Coen Brothers fan, and and I I believe that the Miller's Crossing started with this image of a hat being tossed in the woods. That was like literally where they started the process. Yes. So you know the stories can come from anywhere. I do think, like you, you can see from just the way you talked about it that starting with characters is great because if you feel something, then right there you're motivated, you're connected. It's yes. more than likely that that because of that feeling, that connection, that emotional resonance you feel with the characters, you're going to be more likely to be able to finish that story. Moreover, if you feel a connection with the characters, perhaps that's a good sign that other people will feel a connection with the characters, which is really ultimately what a storyteller needs to do. They need to create that sense of audience identification, of reader identification, where they, we shrink the distance between the, the printed page or the silver screen and the character, uh, the audience, so that they they are pulled into the story world, go into the story, right? We want yeah. them to go into the story. So, uh, so yeah, I, I think you know whatever it takes. At some point, though, engage the characters because it's their story and and they know it better than you, and they want you to tell the story. So just get curious about them, and they'll take you where you need to go. I I I love how you say that. Like, just ask the characters because they know better than you do and because it's like we were because we we're talking about you know psychology and, and your and your subconscious the characters that you have envisioned are probably elements of well they're not probably they are elements of your subconscious that represent potential disunity within yourself and that's why you feel compelled to tell the story in the first place. Oh, absolutely. I think most writers will tell you that the um, the stories they write, or maybe the best stories they write, have something of themselves in there. You know, um, I know Mary Coleman, who is a senior executive at Pixar, and they have a really interesting process. I think they pretty much use since early on, where the the members of the brain trust the filmmakers the directors there andrew stanton and pete doctor and leon Critch, though i think he's uh some like but brad bird and whoever um would be designated with coming in with three ideas which they would then pitch to uh you know uh whoever the head of the company now it's pete doctor basically and invariably it's arising out of their lives for example finding nemo came from Andrew Stanton's experience of being an overprotective father, you know, of, of realizing that he was being too protective of his kids and where would that go? As we mentioned, Pete Doctor's experience with Inside Out. Monsters, Inc. came from discussions about when they were kids and seeing piles of clothes in the clo you know, on the floor at night, you know, and imagining that they were monsters, right? So, um, or imagining that the toys would come to life. So I think that uh, there's probably a lot of truth in that, that, that stories do, the best stories are stories that are a reflection in some respects of the writer's own personal experience. And now that can be a challenge if you're in Hollywood and you're going up for open writing assignments where it's not an original story, it's somebody else's story. It's incumbent on you to find that point of emotional connection. You know, You may not be part of that culture at all, you may not be part of the, they may be a different gender than you, a different uh, uh, gender identity or uh, cultural, you know, uh, socioeconomic, religious, whatever, but you've got to find something about their humanity that you share and that you can, you know, you have an emotional connection to. But yeah, to your general point, I think that's absolutely important. Yeah. I, I know you got to get going. Um again thank you so i've really enjoyed this i hope you've enjoyed being here uh as much as i've enjoyed having this conversation um uh, do you have time for one more question yeah sure sure yeah um what what is something oh i love this question what is something that you wish you knew about oh. writing when you were uh when you were you know in film school or you know a, a young writer that you know now? Well, I never went to film school. <laughs> oh, you did? So, oh, okay, all right. All right no, I, I, I literally, 
I got a, a, a master's of divinity degree, I was going to get a PhD in theological studies and uh, become an academic, but I was a musician, you know, on the side. And I, that was my passion. Again, this unity, I was disconnected from that. And so I said, if I don't, if I don't pursue that, if I don't pursue this creative aspect of my life, I'm going to be disappointed. I know this. I had like a very stark visual image of me in my beautiful study with books, floor to ceiling, gorgeous desk, banker's lamp, this wonderful setup, me sitting there staring off into space, kind of lost and in the corner, in the shadows, my guitar case collecting dust. And that just hit me. And I said, I can't, I can't do that. I've got to, so I took a year off and that became the rest of my life. And I had no idea that I would discover screenwriting. You know, Campbell talks about follow your bliss and the universe will create doors where there once were walls. And this particular door led me to screenwriting. But I would say that if there, you know, there's so many lessons I did, I did a lot of things right, you know, and, and have managed to carve out a career as a screenwriter and have movies made. And I've written over 30 projects at every major Hollywood studio and every, you know, uh, broadcast network with the exception of ABC, which I always joke, that's why I don't watch ABC. Um, you know, there's so many things I also did wrong, you know, that I just should have been smarter about. And, uh, you know, I don't want to end on like a really super pragmatic note because that, that would be something. But I think the main thing is, you know, uh, I wish I had written more spec scripts when I was actively just like write. I was in L.A. I was writing, you know, three projects at a time or two projects at a time and, you know, making money and doing really, really well. But I and I did write some specs, but I wish I'd been more more diligent on that and written at least one per year, because I think that would have helped broaden my exposure as a writer as a solo writer, because my major experience there was as a writing with a writing partner. Yeah. So I guess the takeaway there is just be proactive. You know, just look at what you're doing right now. You know, uh, Lisa Joy, who was one of my students, and she's the co-creator of Westworld. And, you know, she and her husband, Jonah Nolan, and uh, they're just like, you know, a power couple in Hollywood. I had her at a writer's group that uh, she was very kind enough to come to a group I was teaching a uh, weekend workshop in, in UCLA and she came and she talked about how even before she knew she was you know, going to break in she didn't know she was she was like studying to be a lawyer actually was a lawyer at, at some point she started to treat her life as if she were a screenwriter so she managed to squeeze enough hours out of each day doing research breaking story, writing, rewriting, studying the business, reading the trades, you know, acting like what a writer does so that she created patterns of behavior that then enabled her to segue into being a writer because she was already doing that. Moreover, she was being productive. She wrote a spec episode of, uh, uh, of a TV series, and I'm, I'm drawing a blank on it right now, the name of it, but off of that, no, uh, Pushing Daisies. Oh, Off of yeah. that, she actually got hired on that show. Yeah. And then that led to everything else. But had she not written that spec, none of this would have happened. She was proactive. And even though she was working as a lawyer, you know, when you're a first year lawyer, you're working 80 hours a week. She still found talent, time to create a pattern in her life where she was acting as if she were a professional screenwriter, doing all that stuff. So that would be the one thing that I would you know, I would say that I would, you know, carry forward and wish I'd known, though I have to say when I first broke in, I did, I completely just went, you know, that was my film school education those first four or five years where I just was reading everything, writing everything, studying everything, watching everything. But I would say for the takeaway for people who may be watching this, act as if you're already a professional, create the patterns of behavior and, and daily activities, most notably in writing and creating content, that when you get the opportunity to break in, you're ready. 
you, you know how to break story. You know how to write a first draft. You know how to do rewrites. You know how to study the trades. You know who's who in Hollywood. You know the trends of what's being bought. You know, you know, all that stuff. So that would be my sort of long-winded answer on that. Just, you know, treat yourself as if you're a professional writer and, and, and even before you're into the business and that will help segue you into the business. Um, I'm very glad that we ended on that because if, if you do not, if you do not adopt screenwriting as your identity, as your identity, as or at least a part of it, you will never be, you will never manifest that success. No, that's, that, that's amazing. Um, uh, thank you so much, Scott. I really, sure. really love this. I hope you love it too. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I always enjoy talking about this stuff. It's, 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 it's exciting. Stories are just, you know, they're my lifeblood, you know. Stories, stories are fun. I think that's why they keep, they keep bringing me back. They keep bringing us back. Um, thank you, man. Uh, sure. Enjoy the rest of your evening. I really appreciate you it. You too.